Ibu and Nyuran Yang. Uh, hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to episode three of Deadly uh, Dangerous Voices. Uh, this week, we have not only one deadly dangerous voice, but two, and they're both staunch uh, women. One is a black fella, and one is a white fella, eh? So, <laughs> and, and, and we would say white ally, or white Australian ally, or non-Indigenous ally. Um, so, and when I say ally, I mean, you know, not someone who just wants to say yes for Aboriginal people and, and uh, support us just because it's the right thing to do, but people who actually take the time to understand us uh, on a personal level, but also do their research and understand where we've come from and uh, what we're faced with today. And that is Karen Mika. Of course, I'm on Birupai land at the moment. I uh, love living on Birupai country, but originally grew up on Waramai country and was very blessed to be included and raised in the community at Cabarita and spent a lot of time with elders um, as a child. Um, I think one of the things that that enabled me to do as a non-Aboriginal person was to actually be an inside view of the ongoing racism and oppression that others tried to um, deny or to dismiss. So being a child and observing that um, that at a very, very young age meant that I was probably more sensitive to it. What I probably would say is I thank you for calling me an ally in the terms that you have is in someone who has been willing to listen, is that it took me decades to actually recognise that even though I loved Aboriginal people, have Aboriginal family members, have Aboriginal friends. I'm still um, indoctrinated with racial bias. I'm still colonised. I'm still raised as a white person. So therefore, I have to be really careful about how I represent or interpret Aboriginal issues. Um, I see lots of my people who are very, very well-meaning in being exactly as I have been a staunch ally but also not listening also misrepresenting and then because having formed a view then shutting down aboriginal voices that actually don't support that view yeah i appreciate I that and I, I really appreciate your engagement in a lot of the issues that we you know put up there on you know facebook and other social media you're always very engaged and do your research but i want to also uh welcome to the show uh donna armstrong uh is also known as a munro like you said you mentioned jenny and and lyle yeah the the activist parents so yeah being ignorant or or you know ignorance is bliss sort of thing just not a concept that we've ever been able to have really like we've we've been brought up very much um with the activism um very involved you know protest as kids and things like that so yeah so yeah there's a lot that goes into my decisions I think about today but I also have to acknowledge like I listen to what Karen says about um you know being careful I've got to be careful you've got to be careful what we look like um it does and and I can compare to the lives of my siblings lives of you know 50 odd cousins and no one can convince me that that privilege doesn't exist because yeah. it does exist you know like and ha how I'm perceived the sad part about it as again um you would both appreciate we hear what gets said yes. when there's a conception of who we are mm. we hear more of what gets said um, some people don't like to use the term light-skinned Aboriginal. Mm. I don't see that I have a choice because yeah, that's, that's the same. why. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and 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 I don't feel exactly the same as what my visibly dark siblings or my visibly dark family do. Mm. Things are a bit different, so which I guess is why often um, I look to those yarns with you, brother, because yeah. I feel like yeah, we know yeah, where we're, we're the... coming from. In yeah. the same boat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's stuff yeah. that we've had to deal with all our lives. And and mm -hmm. just being cognizant of our privilege, like you said, like our lighter skin privilege, uh, when our darker skin uh, cousins, brothers, sisters, uncles, aunties, 
you know, enter a shop, you know, they're the ones who are harassed by security. Uh, people who are told to move on in the street by uh, policemen, you know, we avoid those things because we're yeah. not perceived yeah. immediately as an Aboriginal person and not perceived as a threat. I'm the eldest of seven. Mm -hmm. um, so I naively used to think as a child that I could protect them. Um, but, you know, very, very quickly realising that, no, I can't. There's nothing I can actually do. Yeah. And even at times my voice and that privilege of my skin doesn't, it, it actually isn't helpful because I think at times I'm probably hated more mm. um, because I make the choice to acknowledge my Aboriginality. I think there's a lot of non-Indigenous people that just can't fathom why the hell I would do that. Yeah. But it is who I am, so how can I not? Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the perception out there a lot of the times for people like us with fair skin is that, you know, we're, we're just professional Aboriginal people, that we're just in it to gain something, whatever that is. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, like myself, have been around for a long time identifying as Aboriginal and, uh, you know, we're doing what we can using our, our privilege in a way uh, and able to um, infiltrate the system and 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 try and make it work for our people. Um, that's that sounds like a paternalistic thing that we we've been put into a position where we do have privilege to have access and and we do mm -hmm. have agency um, as a direct benefit of being lighter skinned. Let's um, come over to Karen now. Um, yeah, so you've uh, been involved for a long time in child protection. What, tell us what you've seen and what you've heard uh, within the department and I guess through your case managing work with Aboriginal families. Look, one of the things that I um, saw was a lot of tokenism. So, yes, we'll get in an Aboriginal person to consult on this family. Um but it was only around, okay, well, we've done the consultation, we'll now do exactly what we want. And one of the things that I found as a non-Aboriginal ally was that I was actually um, under more scrutiny and more attack for protesting against decisions in regards to Aboriginal families that I viewed as being racially biased or systems that were racially biased because somehow it was easy to discount an Aboriginal voice. So, yes, we'll do the token consultation, we'll ask you when, we'll ask you what you think, and then we'll actually tick a box and say, well, that's done. I then come along as an intelligent, articulate white woman and say, well, hang on a minute, you didn't listen. And in actual fact, this is this is pure racial bias. You know, you cannot get out of the fact that this whole system is biased against Aboriginal people, in particular around relative kinship care and the way relative kinship care is assessed and often viewed. So one of the things that I found was that I have a real, um, I suppose, scepticism around notions of consultation and listening to Aboriginal voices because I've seen um, government departments actually set up systems that actually look at engaging Aboriginal workers, actually predominantly employ Aboriginal people so that they can actually stay, but we've got this number of Aboriginal people representing, but nothing changes. Oh. The mm -hmm. terminology, the systems that are put in place to actually look like we're making non-racist decisions actually aren't coming out as evidenced in the end because we're still seeing children consistently being removed um, for reasons that not necessarily would happen in a non-Aboriginal family, overly scrutinised, decisions made around sizes of families, um, you know, relationships in families, all have a racial bias. And yet what we actually see is a system that actually believes because it listens, because it's had an advisory body, that it's therefore actually done something. But nothing's changed. It's just rebranded. And I suppose that's where I come to when it comes to the voice, is the um, scepticism around, okay, let's look at it being a great idea, but what have we actually learnt in history? What have we actually learnt when we start to actually see the... 
um, dismissing of dissenting voices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, I saw and, it in the Trump section all the time. Yep, yep. And, and a lot of people, uh, Aboriginal people, are saying that we feel like we're being talked over by, you know, well-intentioned non-Indigenous people who are, yes, voters, and we feel as if um, these people know what's best for us and they're put in a position to be um, the people who are holding the reins in this because they make up a majority of the population. Um, so the rest of us, you know, the 3%, have to hope that the right decision is made um, for our benefit. Mm -hmm. But yeah, this you know the history that you've had of you know seeing systemic racism play out within these departments. Of course, we you know become skeptical of any offer that you know uh, governments make that is so called you know uh, for our uh, betterment. Um, we have to question that, and 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 right now we really need to question it because. All we're being presented with is um, two sides. We're we're getting the no vote from the LNP and the yes vote from uh, the Labor Party and the Yes Twenty Three campaign. And, and we don't hear the Aunty Jenny Munros. We don't hear the uh, Gary Foley's. We don't hear the Michael Mansells. Um, you have to search these people out to find out what their opinions are, don't you? Where were the discussions with the Ten Embassy Mall? Yeah, yeah, it would have been interesting to see and then we've got that argument now where a lot of non-indigenous people are saying oh they're the the city activists they don't know well yeah they do yeah they have a place why why was there no consultation done there as well well we heard from Karen Stewart Asherton last week that there were yes. 13 dialogues that uh, occurred leading up to uh, that convention in Uluru and you know he sifted through 140 pages uh, of you know the outcomes the reports that were written um, from those dialogues and you know found no one who was pushing for uh, a voice to parliament and and you look at our history I mean we've never been out in the streets you know uh, until more recent times in the last few years, uh, chanting, uh, we want a voice to parliament, we want a voice. It's never been that. It's always been no. land rights. It's always been self-determination uh, and, and, you know, uh, it, treaties. Dad and Jenny were actually uh, up at Uluru during mm. that process up there. Tell and, us about um, this, yeah. Um, I don't know all the full details, but I do know that they very much felt like they weren't listened to at all, that their opinions were completely discounted. And from what I understand, they were eventually thrown out of the process mm. um, and, and voiced a bit of that outside. But what was the point of that? So you did have exactly what you're saying, that dissenting voice was there mm. and, and gotten rid of. Yep. And yep. sent out meeting and then not able to attend so you know what what was the harm what was the fear in hearing those dissenting voices what was everyone so afraid of which well, which makes me wonder a bit, are we talking about a setup that's yeah. a consultation process. that's yeah. called consultation but is a very orchestrated well set up meeting with agendas that also include those agendas not hearing other sides of the conversation. Yeah. Well, Kieran had pointed out last week that, um, you know, the Uluru statement was virtually written before the actual uh, conference came together and it was like a take it or leave it scenario. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's what, that's my understanding of it very much so that, um, yeah, anybody that was there that, that wasn't on board with that, wasn't really welcome and i mean there's going back to tokenism as far as like having you know these voices be heard and and the abc i guess promotes itself as unbiased uh, objective try to look at all sides of the story let's let's unpack uh this week's program from four corners um what what did you make of that uh, Karen, what did you get from that? What was your takeaway from that program? For me, where I sit is I feel very confused about how should I vote? 
and I, my original um, view was that I'm not voting at all because I don't oh. believe that I have that right. I've since been contacted by a number of Aboriginal activists who've actually not told me how to vote. They've just actually said, use your vote, use mm. it. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I found in regards to watching Muddy Waters was that I actually did see that it showed a cross-section um, of um, people who had differing views, even down to non-Aboriginal people who were voicing the same thing as, as me, is how can we vote? How can we make this, this determination? Yeah. One of the things that was also obvious is that there's a very clear racist no. And I think that where my concerns are is that this whole campaign is politically divided. So it's, you know, um, not necessarily around people's, um, how, how can I say it? I, I can just say is, is that when you start to see a large percentage of a population who are actually saying, I'm voting because I don't want to associate with this side of politics or I don't want to associate with that side of politics. For me, mm -hmm. that's not a good enough reason to actually vote. There's no thought in that. Saying, well, I don't like Peter Dutton, so therefore I'm not voting that way, or I'm on side with Anthony Albanese, so I'll vote this way, is really not a good good way to to determine for a entire population of people is so, so for me, one of the things that um, I'm not concerned about this this hysteria. We don't want to wake up and find out we're a racist country. Mm -hmm. Like, excuse me, but you should when realize this to, by now. When <laughs> are we going to wake up and realize that we are a racist country? Yep. If a no vote proves on the international stage that we are a racist country, well, then that's the truth. That yep. is the reality. We we are a country that has. Ex extreme cognitive dissonance around actually accepting that we have ex extreme institutionalized racism. Yeah. I'm more concerned with oppression. I'm more concerned with the much more subtle signs of accepting Aboriginal people as long as they don't make trouble. Yeah. So if you were a yeah. if you were a good don't be black too black. Person, don't be too black. Yes. Don't, don't be too no, black, don't be too yeah. radical, don't descend, don't don't cause trouble. You only have to look at things like Adam Gord's um, Latrell Mitchell. Anyone who actually is an Aboriginal person can actually achieve greatness. They can be a Brownlow medalist. But if they actually dissent, then the message is that we do not accept you. Now, my yeah. concern yeah. isn't necessarily that that they're attacking, say, at that time, Adam Goods or Latrell Mitchell, is they're giving a message to every single Aboriginal person in this country, keep your mouth shut. Mm -hmm. Keep your mouth shut, be a good black person, yep. and we will accept you. To yep. me, when I start to look at what are my concerns in regards to the voice, it's not that... Um, it's, it's an incongruent process, okay? So we're saying, okay, we're going to give a voice to Aboriginal people as long as you shut up over here because we don't want to hear your Aboriginal voice. We want to hear the Aboriginal voice that actually tells us that we're all benevolent, good, mm -hmm. non-racist people. So yep. for me, when I start to see Aboriginal people consistently being talked over, shouted down by non-Aboriginal yes voters, just dismissing and talking over Aboriginal people is, how can you say you want a voice? Yep. This is so yep. totally incongruent. The whole process yep. is mm -hmm. not one that actually signifies that when there is a voice that you're going to actually listen to it if it's something you don't want to hear. Yeah. Yeah, and, and the way the thing's set up, I mean, we've we've had, you know, those advisory groups and we've listed them before in the past. And, yeah, the government has chosen to listen or not to listen. And that is the mm -hmm. problem with this voice is that Aboriginal people see it as powerless uh, and that it's, it's, it's just an advisory uh, body. It doesn't have veto powers to stop say, you know, the NT intervention happening again, mm -hmm. uh, that racially targeted Aboriginal people, uh, domestic violence only happened in Aboriginal communities and alcoholism. And so the government had to intervene and, you know, target Aboriginal people as if those issues don't exist outside of Aboriginal communities. So the, mm -hmm. the government still has the power to do that. So they they can listen to or not listen to the voice. And, and that's, I think, 
what a lot of the yes 23 um uh supporters don't understand um the intricacies of it um mm -hmm. what's behind the I, I guess this veil of a unity you know that is this was expressed in this program this week is that um and it was ian ham um mostly about he made the statement uh this this um, referendum will expose Australia to what we are as a nation, and this is all about just coming together and being unified. Donna, what what are your thoughts on? Well, on this I was very similar to Karen, and in the beginning, when this all started, um, I just very much felt like, well, I won't be bothering. I won't be bothering to vote. I won't be bothering to participate because. I saw the comment sections before this started to say that this is what's divided Australia to me is just one of the most ludicrous statements I've come across at my age um, because we were divided well before that. It's always about, you know, the black fellas, the white fellas, who's yep. the, you know, the racist and all the rest. I bring it down to a bit just it's about majority rules. Mm. That that's and it's always been the case in the world and in any context. Majority rules. That's how it is. It just happens to be that majority in in our country is white people. Mm. Um, you know, so it's not a win situation as far as I'm concerned. And I just don't see a yes prevailing, regardless mm. of. I, I also I really feel for people who do have the right intention and want to do the right thing. Mm. Um. I found it hard to be asked about what I think, whether I'm going to do a yes or no. I really don't want to answer most people on that because I feel like I'm only being baited anyway by being yep. asked that. Yep. If I say that I, I probably won't participate um, in the referendum, well, then there is, like Karen said, you know, you've got people saying, well, you, you should have your say. It just doesn't feel to me like my say is worth it. We're, yeah. We're 3%, 3% like... It's been decided and won't be decided by us. I would have liked this whole process to be a bit more like the big brother voting process as opposed to the survivor one. Mm. The survivor one where they they talk and they manipulate and they con and they even actually attack each other for not wanting to pick that person. You you get to the vote night and the where they get chucked out, you almost know exactly who's going long before it actually happens and so with the big brother process I noticed you're not allowed to speak you're going to get in trouble for that to keep your opinion to yourself you go in there and you vote with your own heart without that manipulation and that's how I would have liked I would have liked to have seen what Australia actually has in their heart mm. of their own accord without a lot of the rubbish that I've seen go on rubbish like the CPAC thing I've lost a lot of hope watching yeah. that professionals and politicians who who have voices who choose to speak and use those voices in the way that they do is actually quite nauseating I think let's let's get back to the program this week on the ABC Muddy Waters uh there was mention that there have been the best minds involved in the shaping of the voice um, that, you know, came out of the dialogues from the conference. How do you feel about that uh, statement? Who interprets and decides who the best minds are mm. is, is probably my question back to how do we say that they're the best minds and how do the rest of us all accept that just on face value or what's been said? We were talking before about the conservatism that exists within our own communities that mm -hmm. politics is very different and we're seeing that playing out is that these voices that are the go-to mouthpieces uh, for the yes 23 campaign would be described by a lot of aboriginal people as conservative uh, conservatives and and right wing well also i think that there's um if you look at our area in particular look at places like kempsey um maury where as much as people deny it, there is full-on institutionalised racism going on in those communities and in those towns. I would question the ability of our mob who live in those towns to be able to even pay attention to any of this. 
mm. daily survival in itself. Yep. Take precedence to reading, listening, checking. Are these the best minds? Have I ever heard from this person before? Do I know anything about? I just think that in a lot of our communities, people really have no idea what's going on. Mm. But what they're hearing is some of the same nastiness and the same uh, racism-based comments and behaviours that we've seen probably our whole lives. That's a very... Keep the keep the hell away from it because mm, mm. it it's too much. It's too much to process it all in a daily life that's often just around survival. We saw a, a bit of that with um, uh, Gary and Jenny Trindle in Walgett, uh, who have been delivering you know fresh fruit, uh, fruit and veg to a community there in Walgett. Uh, and they were talking about Murdy Parky um, as an organisation that represents uh, like over 13 uh, different working parties who, <laughs> you know, feed in concerns to this group, the Murdy Parky um, uh, council. And then there's a chairperson of that council that takes all those concerns as a leader, as a spokesperson um, to parliament. And the journalist was talking about, well, isn't this, you know, a great model for the voice? Well, I'm sorry, like Murdy Parkey is, is existing and it is a voice to parliament. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that? I mean, it, we, we have uh, self-determination in that model. Well, Already, it it's back there. To the voice, but not being listened to. Because mm. it's not like we've never had a voice. And yeah. some people have been very vocal. But, again, you're questioning, like, it look, that's where people are being listened to is before it gets to Parliament. Mm. Then when it gets to Parliament, mm. it's being heard then. So yeah. it might be a great model, but can it be taken through to the end? And that's mm. that remains to be seen. Karen, you can jump in at any time there. What do you that's think? okay. I'm, I'm just listening, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that one of the things that I'm hearing um, or seeing in, in social media for non-Aboriginal people is this notion that it would be an absolute disaster for Aboriginal people to not have a yes vote, to not have a voice because this is their only chance for a voice, mm -hmm. that they've never had a voice before, that if this goes down, they'll never have this chance again. And for me, I sit back and I start to say, well, hang on, on a minute, we're talking about a racist no vote, but have we ever considered that there's also a racist yes vote? Mm -hmm. And I'm not talking about the ugly underbelly of racism that we see being overtly played out. It's the, that notion of paternalism. Mm. that Aboriginal people can't do this without us, that mm. Aboriginal people haven't had a voice, or the notion that I'm going to vote for all of the Aboriginal people who live in remote communities because I'm not mm. voting for the Aboriginal voices that are actually dissenting, the voices of people like Noel Pearson and Marcia Langton. Yes, they are very powerful Aboriginal voices. I mean, Marcia Langton's fierce. Um, but there are also very, very powerful Aboriginal voices, Celeste Liddell, um, you know, Linda June Coe, Roxley Foley, Gary Foley, Mike Manson. They're also these very, very powerful progressive voices that we seem to just pretend don't exist. We can somehow discount and dismiss them as being not Aboriginal enough or, you know, being too urban Um and it's too not, radical, too radical. Too, too, too radical. And, and, it comes and I back. think there's a fear, like, of uh, having more Lydia Thorpes in, in the Senate. I Absolutely. mean, it's the first time we've actually seen an Aboriginal person in the parliament being so vocal and, and mm -hmm. telling the truth, how it is. I think that's what they're scared of because, I mean, Mansell's talking about the real solution is to have more of our voices in parliament, not outside Absolutely. parliament. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, I, I come back to I've got a, a, a radical child who um, I didn't radicalise. He has come up with some of his own views, but his ideal is that, you know, one day there'll be um, 
an Aboriginal Prime Minister, that there mm -hmm. will be not just Aboriginal representation of Aboriginal senators, but there will actually be an Aboriginal Prime Minister. He also questions, I mean, and he was only 10, 11 years old at the time, of, well, why can't there be a sub-parliament? Why can't there be a parliament for Aboriginal people? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, yeah. the, the notion that we know best is the fundamental basis of, of, of racism and you know it, it's the superiority that we're going to be able to achieve this for Aboriginal people as if Aboriginal people can't achieve it for themselves exactly. yes they need us to listen and to get out of the way sit down shut up and um, you know start to actually act but as far as the voice goes I, I'm, I'm still undecided on how I'm going to vote or whether I'm going to vote at all. Mm. But my biggest concern is that when you ask, also talk about who were the other people that were represented in the formulation of the um, Uluru Statement, and it wasn't just powerful voices like Marcia Langton. There were also a number of non-Aboriginal interests that were vested in that process, and many of them are linked to mining. When you talk about... Um, Marcia Langton being a fierce uh, advocate and just on the ABC uh, this morning with Patricia Carvelos she identified that Marcia Langton has actually had affiliations with you know people like Twiggy Forrester uh, yeah. Andrew Forrester from WA and yeah she's a fierce person and and she's scary um, I've met her <laughs> and um <laughs> and, and I always had a lot of respect for her, but I'm sort of now questioning these leaders uh, because of their affiliations with people like Twiggy Forrester, because I know people in the Pilbara who talk about how he operates. So if he doesn't, uh, you know, get a yes to his next mining project from the traditional owners of, the, of that land that he wants to uh, you know, source the the different resources from. Uh, he'll go to a neighbouring um tribe and get them to yeah. kick off. Yeah, you know? yeah. So that's how he operates. And this is the guy, uh, who is supporting this campaign. There's Rio Tinto who just bulldozed over Juke and George. They're involved in it. I mean, when I wake up personally, when I wake up and I hear a no vote. I'm going to feel sad that people think that I am supporting, you know, the LNP, you know, yeah. that I, I leveraged, I helped leverage that no campaign. And I saw but, that happen to you. No, in no, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, but I'm no, or I'm boycotting. So yep. maybe to make the vote count, you know, I'll go and say no, but I'll say it from a whole different perspective, I don't even listen to the trolls. I don't even read what the uh, racist trolls are saying in support of the LNP or what the LNP are saying, because it's all nonsense, um, you know, because I listen to Lydia Thorpe. I listen to the Progressive No campaign, uh, people like Kieran Stewart, um, Asherton, and, and people who are out there don't have the platform and why they're saying no, because... You know what, like you said, um, uh, Karen, before, is that we've had voices. We've had staunch, radical voices and, and have achieved many she, things she, for our people. Yeah. Yes. You know, and, and this is the problem, is that the people who are voting yes, the people who just want to do good, uh, uh, well-meaning and want to do good for Aboriginal people, don't know that history. And that's really interesting because I always see when we talk about truth telling and, you know, black armband um, history and all that kind of stuff, is that when we shut down dissenting voices, when we shut down the voices that actually are going to tell us things that are horrendous, that we don't want to hear, we also shut down the voices of all of the, po the positive things. We shut down that there's no truth and no understanding of the the, the resilience, um, the innovation of Aboriginal people, the, the fact that when you actually look at one of the takeaway things for me from the Muddy Waters one was how they set up the model for domestic violence mm -hmm. um, uh, refuges um, in the Walgarawarana area, how those Aboriginal women just went in, got the funding, and then said, well, we're not going to do it the way that 
you say that we need to do it, we're going to do it for what works for our people because we know what works for our people. At a grassroots level, we have seen stories repeatedly of Aboriginal people, Aboriginal communities that have actually solved their own problems, that have actually looked at it and looked at the model presented by non-Aboriginal people and are able to actually say, yeah, okay, well, we could take a bit of that, but we can also actually see how it's not going to... I love your dogs here. Sorry, <laughs> At least I'm only being talked over by Donna's dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Um, but but the thing is is that is that those are the stories that we don't hear. As soon as we mm. say, well, we don't want to hear dissenting voices, then we're actually not just cutting out the negatives that we don't want to hear. We're also not hearing of that whole what in in amidst all of the stuff that we don't want to hear, there is so much power. Yeah. My yeah. biggest You're concern... talking about Grace Gordon, and I was going to get onto this. Grace yeah, yeah. Gordon is um, the one who runs that women's safe house yeah. that you're talking about. And, and she says in the interview that she's um, frustrated with the government and is skeptical of, of this yes vote, but the journalist doesn't take it further he doesn't no, unpack that no, no. that's the problem is that no that's here's exactly an intelligent it. person who has been exactly. involved in aboriginal affairs for a long time but you know there's an opportunity to explore why she's skeptical but they don't and that for me is that the, the the concern for me in, in regards to how we're formulating this voice is there's not enough detail around how it's going to work. But when you actually look at, say, just that example of how he didn't unpack it, mm. then we talk about the process of how we're actually getting towards creating a voice. The very process actually says that a voice isn't going to work because we don't unpack it. We don't go further. We don't want to hear these voices. Mm. My biggest concern is when you come back to things like Rio Tinto, Twiggy Forest, the whole, that whole mm. notion is mm. that we talk about, we're, we're talking about the voice as a way of Aboriginal people taking their voice to government to be heard. Yeah. What we're not hearing is how is government going to use that voice? And my biggest concern when we talk about oppression, when we talk about um, not listening to dissenting voices, does the voice then actually become a way to silence dissenting voices? Yeah. So if, for instance, there is this whole notion of like um, that happens in the Pilbara, if I don't get an agreement on a mining lease here, I'm going to go to another community. and I'm going to keep going until I find somebody that actually endorses and gives me a legitimate power to actually do it because I can say, well, this mob over here actually said that it's fine. Yeah. For me, I'm not opposed to there being a voice I'm not opposed to, to, to being heard. What I'm opposed to is how that voice may get misused. If it's actually yes. misused to say, ah, but the voice said it's okay. Mm -hmm. This group of people we have selected have said that it's okay for us to do it. They have endorsed it. Yeah. When yeah. we're actually seeing a larger percentage of people saying, well, no, we don't want that. They see, for instance, someone proposes another Northern Territory intervention. I don't know, let's go into um, Queensland this time because at the time of the Northern Territory intervention, there was far more non-Aboriginal children in Northern Territory, in, in Queensland being sexually abused. Let's yeah, yeah. say we're going to go into there. What if someone in the voice or the, the voice that says, well, yeah, that's fine, let's go ahead. Mm. Where does everyone else stand? Everyone exactly. else then. Everybody else then actually goes, but it's the voice. That's what we voted for. And mm. all of the well-meaning yes voters then actually have the belief that whatever comes out of the voice is going to be what Aboriginal people want. And I think that was another point that was brought up in um, the Muddy Waters is that your representation is only as good as the person who's representing you. Issues that are coming out of Walgett come through you to your chair and then go to that's right. that national body. That's, that's exactly right. But your voice is only as good as the person that's representing you. Yeah, I mean, we can, every Australian can represent as an individual or a group to parliament, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so why does why do Aboriginal people need a special voice that is uh, going to be elected? Uh, we, you know, have been told. And and what you were pointing to, Karen, the fear of of how this voice can be manipulated. If these uh, voices are already in cahoots with different mining company executives. Um, then what's not to say that the voice can't be um, a one-stop shop 
uh, where you can bypass the traditional owners of that country they, where you want to reap resources from and just go to the voice, get them to tick off because, you know, there's a, there could be a deal in it for them. Um, there's safety, yeah. actually. There is some consideration of safety by actually not being acknowledged. I think back mm. to that movie um, Am Amstad, I think it's called, yeah. um, where uh, they're on a slave ship yes. and, you know, the, the following abhorrent behaviour by the, the runners of the ship, um, the male slaves got up and defended themselves and took over the ship. When mm. they got back to land, of course, you know, the government wants to um, charge them with murder and, and all these other charges. Very clever solicitor uh, realised quite quickly that uh, they were put as cargo. That's mm. what they were referred to was as cargo, not as human beings. Mm. Therefore, mm. you cannot charge cargo with murder. Mm. Mm. So and I always think back to that and think there was some level of protection on that occasion mm. by not being acknowledged. Mm -hmm. So... That's my That's question. That's really interesting. About, yeah. You know, the constitution that yeah. maybe we are safer if we're not acknowledged. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if we are acknowledged, then what rules, what regulations, as you said, Northern Territory stuff, all of that. So what what are we open to then mm. by actually being acknowledged? And I think that's my fear because I can't know what's going to happen. Yeah. I can't know how that'll be used and what voices will be the voices. Yeah. So yeah, that that's a concern. And I don't mm. want to be backward, so to speak, but there's that little part of me that wonders if I'm safer, if I'm of safer by actually mm. not being acknowledged. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting point because a lot of people believe also that, you know, we're negating our sovereignty by, mm -hmm. you know, signing up to the constitution, being enshrined in the Australian constitution. I need something, I need some proof, and I've been like that with other elections, not just the referendum but other elections. I need more than just words, and for me personally, deaths in custody is huge. It's, mm. it's a like, mm. very, very prevalent topic in my family for a long time. Dad was on the uh, watch committee for the Royal Commission. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the, the little olive branch would be to implement some of the recommendations. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's you know, firsthand because you can. You can do that right now yeah. and that could possibly send me to a yes if I felt that that's where our government yeah. stood from mm. um, to do that because for me personally, I, I, I can see everyone in the mob, we get very disheartened. We're up to over 500 deaths mm. since the Royal Commission. Yeah. That's hard stuff. But for us personally, as a family and the children of a man who was on that um, watch committee, mm. that work that he done and his participating in that, with, it goes without saying, um, that damages people. Mm. Okay, so then what it does is there's a, there's a flow-on effect to the children mm. of those people. So yep. not only do I feel like what was the point of the Royal Commission, not just in terms of all of us, but in terms of my family and the damage emotionally and psychological that that has caused to be this many years later, nothing's changing and it's mm. just getting worse. And yep. what annoys me, I think, the most about that is there's a real lack of um, understanding and empathy in regard to deaths in custody mm. by non-Indigenous people. And that's that's the concern for me. And we look at things like incarceration and we've got our privatised jails and things. Yeah. I'm trying to get out there and tell people that the quotas that our government promises to these privatised jails, mm. our 3% won't be enough to cut it. Mm. Mm. So all this ignorance of what's going on for us, it's going to come and bite you on the backside later mm -hmm. because there won't be enough of our mob to fill those quotas. Yeah. So, you know, it'll be, the, it'll be Karen's kids. It'll be, you know, a lot of my friends' kids mm. that might be at risk in the future just because someone's signing contracts on how many butts need to be in that jail. Yeah. And if you're paid to have them in there, I mean, common sense says you're not letting them out, are you? Mm. I mean, you're, so, you're talking about, uh, you know, a, a group of intelligent people who did the research, did the interviews with family who lost loved ones to the system, 
uh, between, was it 87 and 1990, and then the Royal Commission report with the 339 recommendations uh, were tabled to Parliament in 1991. Uh, and the, all the answers are in that document to address the issues that you're talking about, the high incarceration rates, uh, the fact that police literally get away with murder because of the way the system's set up to protect them, uh, you know, to make them impervious to, you know, criminal prosecution. So the only justice we ever get, so-called justice, is through the coronial court system um, where we can prove, you know, that these coppers or uh, CSOs, uh, corrective service officers in um, the detention centres were culpable but they still won't get criminally charged. <laughs> like, no, no. And um, they even give evidence. They, they, th there's a choice for them to give evidence at these inquests. That yeah. was something that I didn't understand in the beginning. I sort of thought if the coroner tells you that you need to speak, then you need to speak. Mm -hmm. But after going through the process, that's not the case at all. And there, there becomes almost a let's not upset these police that are going to get on this stand because they'll refuse to get on it and then we won't get anywhere. So I'd like to see a lot more people who put their mouth up to how they think it all is attend some inquests. Quite yeah. a few of them are public and I would suggest that a lot of people need to intend, attend an inquest mm. to, to really understand what goes on and mm. how that in so many ways it's actually just more abuse. Yeah, yeah. So... Again, like going back to the fact that there were intelligent voices who put together these these 339 recommendations, but they've been collecting dust ever since. Uh, you know, the, all the solutions, many, many solutions are in that document, but they're, they're useless if governments aren't going to listen to the recommendations. And, and so... If and we've had royal commissions ever since, you know, there's mm -hmm. been a number of royal commissions. So, yeah, like people talk about the voice being a start, like, <laughs> and we started so much, but we never get them completed because governments do not, uh, don't have the will uh, to begin with. It's seen as too hard. Like one of the recommendations out of the uh, royal commission was to set up the council for reconciliation. Well, mm -hmm. that was an easy thing to do, wasn't mm -hmm. it? Like, let's just yep. set up a, a, another body, you know, another yep. advisory group. That's it's the same with the voice. Is that it's a whole lot easier to actually get just another advisory body together than it is to set up a truth commission and you know um, get the real history of this country out to every pocket of society, not just in our education system, but um, dare I say through RAPS, uh, reconciliation action plans, but, you know, something a little bit more in depth than a, just mm -hmm. a, a short little wor workshop, um, you know, like, and, and to engage in treaties, plural, like that, mm -hmm. that is a lot of work, you know like what a lot of Aboriginal people are saying is that we deserve better and we do. We've had like many, many voices, you know, um, lobbying for criminal justice reform, lobbying for self-determination, lobbying for land rights. I think that was something that I actually raised right from the beginning was where are all these people who were voting yes, where were they standing when they came out with the bringing, home, the bringing them home report, where mm. they lobbied for the, um, you know, Royal Commission findings to be action, where were they protesting when the Northern Territory intervention actually occurred? There's a lot of talk, but there's been very little action to prove that anything is going to change. So for me, I was saying from the beginning, well, you know, I'm suspicious and 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 and, and sceptical in regards to constitutional recognition because I've watched over the last 20 years it repeatedly be rejected by Aboriginal people. Now mm -hmm. suddenly we're saying we'll give you a voice, but the catch is that it has to go with constitutional recognition. I mean, a voice could have been legislated. It didn't have to be with constitutional recognition. Mm -hmm. For me, if the campaign had started at a different time in a different place, um, 
then things would have been been very different in how I how I perceived how I would would, would vote. So, for instance, if I had actually seen that there'd been some commitment to the Royal Commission into um, Aboriginal deaths in custody, there'd been some commitment to you know furthering um, the bringing them home report, the findings in the bringing them home report, then I probably would have actually had a very different view. What I have seen is that, I don't know, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but there was something in the way that the racist no campaign kicked in so quickly and so easily from where it kicked in, from the LNP. Mm -hmm. It was straight away, my first thought was, hang on a minute, is this just to design, is this designed for a win-win for LNP or for the no? Because if there's a no vote, if the no is out, outcome is what comes about, then that actually gives power to the LNP. But wasn't it the LNP that actually set up wanting constitutional recognition in the beginning? So yes, therefore, exactly. so so therefore, why yep. are you now going no? Because mm. if you were in power, wouldn't have been a yes. And I'm sitting there and thinking, is showing the racist underbelly of mm. this country designed to actually make sure that there is no dissenting voices heard from Aboriginal yeah. people? Because yeah, as yeah. soon as you actually, and we saw that on the Muddy Waters program, as soon as you actually say, well, hang on a minute. I'm not sure about it. Yes, the immediate immediate um, conclusion is you're a racist. Mm. Yep. So for me, I look at the the, the the racist no campaign. How quick it kicked off. Yeah. And was it designed to actually force us into a conscious conscience vote? I don't want to be yes. a racist country. I don't want to be seen as a racist. So therefore, I'm yep. going to vote yes. Yeah. Um, I mean. I was thinking along the same lines and, you know, we we might be uh, um, identified as conspiracy theorists, uh, like just yeah. putting that out there, but it, it's a very real concept, yeah. I feel like the piggy in the middle, We I think we talked about this before, Karen, the whole mm. piggy in the middle game concept where I'm piggy in the middle but I am not catching that ball from mm. either side. I don't want yeah. the ball, you know, <laughs> it, even if the ball yeah. hits me, I'm yeah. still not putting my hands on it. I'm just going <laughs> to go down and, you know, like, yeah, feel very much like the piggy in the middle and i got no idea. I so think a lot of people in the same boat. Yeah, yep. well, I'd be doing voting days probably, you know, trying to <laughs> protect myself from the ball and just survive yeah. that day and then whatever else comes from it afterwards, like you say. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, <laughs> Like the AEC, the Australian Electoral Commission, endorsed um, the LNP in 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 its uh, ability to spread this fear mongering. Really, like there was no solid arguments for them to say no. Yet there is a progressive no out there that is very articulate, intelligent, very researched, know why they want to say no, but they're not being heard. It's this ridiculous no camp. And going back to your your own conspiracy theory, Karen, if you, you know, I just, whenever you hear conspiracy theory, you just immediately, old people immediately go to those <laughs> uh, people with tinfoil hats sort of thing, you know, that... Was was it an orchestrated launch into a mm. racist no? Was there was there was there something further behind that? You automatically discount and go, oh no, that couldn't be possible. It couldn't be. It it couldn't it couldn't be. Yeah. But what it what it does is 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 that once again it shuts down the questions. It shuts yeah. down mm -hmm. the inquiring mind. And that uh, for me, I think, for when someone says, well, why aren't I just a jump in there yes person? I mean, I'm obviously someone who has been some surrounded by and supported by Aboriginal and, and supportive of Aboriginal people all my life. So why aren't I automatically a, a yes? Why am I sitting here with all these questions and doubts and, and scepticism? Mm. And it comes back down to the fact that we're not unpacking it and we're not allowed to. It's like yeah. someone, there's a huge lid on it. Let's just keep this all. And that's where I actually am uncomfortable. I'm uncomfortable with voting for something where um, I'm seeing oppression for me i find it uh impossible to be 
completely objective. And if anyone was, yeah. you know, really honest, would honest, yeah, understand that you know we have subjective truths, and and it's impossible yeah. to cover every every truth that's out there. And mm. and what they've done is simplified this issue that it's black and white. It's Labor versus Liberal, and and that's it. There's and so when I present a program like this, I I am straight out, straight up. I'm subjective. I am biased. I am biased towards the voices that are not being heard in this so-called mm-hmm. debate. Um, the the people in between um, that you know, uh, and, and these shows, these programs, bias programs like this are, are so necessary because. You know what? What um, other people have termed the hidden transcript. So you've got you know the popular transcript, which is um, aired on you know through all our news media, um, radio, TV, whatnot. But then you've got this hidden transcript. These voices that you know we're putting out there uh, that you know need to be given light. Um, yeah. And I'm not as game to get on a soapbox to the no. world. That's yeah. that's always, you know, something I'm very wary about that yeah. I'm I'm not always game because I'm not a hundred percent sure of anything right now. Mm. It's all become very confusing and yeah. and and the things that you've stuck by all your life all of a sudden aren't getting you through anymore. The mm. the stances you take and how your mind works, that's all been mixed up, particularly over the last couple of years. So the whole getting out there and saying, I believe this and I know I'm right, I have a lot of trouble with that. I I find it's more a lot of question. I just want to question. I just want to talk. I want to yarn, like you Mm. say, Um, Mm. you know, and and be in a more comfortable realm, I guess, where it is more of a chat where you're not waiting to be attacked and you you know you're not being set up. A a lot of us are are just... um anti the referendum in the first place because yeah, of the yes. way that it's been framed and and yes. and the process behind it without the proper consultation like going back to the interview with um kieran stewart asherton uh you know from his research finding that you know around five percent of our communities were consulted five percent yes. And mm-hmm. and they, you know, we're getting this information. They talk about disinformation and misinformation. Well, a lot of that's coming from the Yes23 campaign who are, and, you know, expressing that they've done all this wide consultation when it's not the truth. E- even in spaces that I'm in at the moment, and I've been in one this morning, um, where I've simply asked the question is, why are you talking over Aboriginal people in this group who are actually saying that they've got reasons for, for wanting a no vote? And then being automatically assumed that I'm going to vote no as well. And I say, well, I didn't say what I was going to, how I was going to vote. I was simply asking, why are you speaking over voices, mm. Aboriginal voices? Why aren't we listening to dissenting voices? And one of the things that I think that repeatedly comes back to is that that's then justified, well, um, hang on a minute, but 80% of, 83% of Aboriginal people want this. And you go, well, 80% or 83%, do you realise that that came from a poll of 300 people and another poll of 700 people? And not one of them had to identify or actually prove their Aboriginality. So we get this whole myth that um, but 80% or 83% of people want it. And yet we haven't unpacked, as you said, that Kieran has pointed out, is that 5% of Aboriginal people were involved in the consultation process, not 80%. Um, It's a whole misinformation that when we talk about the whole notion of truth-telling, there'll never be any truth-telling because we can't even get the truth right on basic fundamental things like this exactly yeah. there's comparisons too between this referendum and going back to the other referendum from years and years ago and yeah. i think there's constantly what's going through my head is social media and where we're at i don't think they're comparable in any way whatsoever no. to say you know look the australian people came out before and we're in support of aboriginal people um in at that time People were at home making decisions, thinking more so in their own family group. I remember back then, all them years ago, that 
your grandparents didn't talk about voting. If you if you asked them who they were voting for, they'd say that's none of your business. It's private. You know, they, they wouldn't yeah. talk about voting. Exactly. Where we are today, yeah. the the aggression that comes from you disagreeing is that and like it, it is like you say, Karen, it's almost like an oppression. You voice something different, you're gonna get jumped on. And and sometimes in the masses, it, thousands mm. of comments directed at you and attacking you. Mm. So it's just not comparable at all. And I would prefer the old where I felt more like people would make own decisions from their hearts. Yeah. Like yeah. they they would use, I always say, I think you need to use the brain, the heart, so the heart, the mind, and the soul. Mm. And I think a lot of time most people in this world are only using one or two of those options when they're making decisions that are important or that are, you know, life-changing, I would like to see more people use the three together mm. to make whatever decision they're going to make and for it to actually come from inside of them as opposed to being influenced so much by what's being said. Even if it's you don't believe it, sometimes it just, you think back to, you know, our mob in police stations, if you just admit to this, you know, you can go home home just <laughs> say that you've done it sort of thing i feel like there must be some of the people that are out there going well i'm just gonna say what they want me to say because i'm sick of being attacked for mm. not saying it or for doing as you're doing karen and actually posing questions about why they're thinking what they're thinking so that's one thing i found interesting is this comparisons to two totally different referendums in two totally different eras with with such a difference in how much we are subjected to other people's minds and thoughts and hearts. And I, I would have loved to have known what Australia actually thought from its own hearts. And so I tend to think, you know, if someone's asked me what they should do, which there are some non-Indigenous people asking me. Mm. I just, when I can't decide myself at this point, I can't tell anyone else what to do, but I'm really focused on, on that day, you do what you need to do to be okay with you tomorrow. That's all. You know, if you feel you've got to do a yes, that's what's in your heart, then you do the yes. Don't don't agonise too much on what will be the issue afterwards. And the mining thing is a concern, but I also feel like at the end of the day, governments do whatever the hell they want mm. whether it's in policy whether it's agreed on whether it's not they were blowing up our stuff before this mm. um, there were rules where they weren't meant to and they didn't and took the whole rather than ask permission we'll just apologize later type of thing mm -hmm. so I do I do have that fear like I said about if we're recognized does life get harder mm. but at the same time, I, I, I can't be going off at anyone who wants to say yes because that's what they feel in their heart. I mm. feel, you know, you do what you got to do so that you wake up okay with yourself tomorrow morning regardless of what the rest of the world actually think. What alternatives you would like to see? If, if there is a no, you know, that comes out of this, what would you like to see happen then? Again, I think it has to come to, to truth-telling. And I think the truth telling needs to, as I said before, is not to just focus on the harms that have been done, but to also look at educating Australians about the resilience um, of Aboriginal people, the resistance of Aboriginal people, and the fact that there are people, Aboriginal people, who are more than capable of self-governing and self-determining. Um, I, I want to move away from that whole paternalistic that it's my people imposing on your people uh, a notion of how to be governed. Um, so for me, anything that leads to self-determination, self-government, and Australians actually moving away from that paternalistic point of view that we are the ones that are going to solve your problem. Because to me, that's what the voice sounds like, is that we're giving you this opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it, it needs to be one where we actually respect that Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people can know better or best for what um, suits them or what, what works for them. 
And that's been proven, proven time and time again, that you are capable of it and that we need to just actually bow out. You know, you can identify white privilege. Um, Absolutely. With, and, you know, the uh, what you're privileged to as opposed to your Aboriginal brothers and sisters. And, um, yeah, that, that's the difference when I was saying before that there's an ally and then there's an ally, you know, mm. like... They do have some good intentions. Mm. And if if stuff goes bad, I don't want people hating on themselves, you know, or, you yeah. know, getting so close to the thing that they think of things like suicide and that because they That's feel bad. Real. Like, mm. like that, that concerns me that, mm. yeah, because the intention is there. Yeah. But I, I find the real ally thing. Of late, there's been a couple of times in conversations with people I've known for years, you know, how you can know someone for 30 years and then they say that thing that goes, oh, crap, you're one mm, of them. <laughs> you're mm. like, I really thought that you were my friend sort of yeah. thing. Grant, I actually got Facebook jail um, for hate speech, against, my, a fa you hate speech against myself. I actually referred to myself as having a white confusing ass. And I got... <laughs> I got, I got <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was actually around was the fact that Aboriginal people and white people actually don't know where I sit. Mm. They can't work out which. Mm. So I, I, I often get, it often You're gets a that I'm an Aboriginal person. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, um, I, I couldn't imagine bec imagine saying <laughs> to, to someone, aren't you concerned about offending white people? <laughs> because there are white people out there that seriously need to be offended. Yeah, oh, exactly. I guess that my response sometimes too is, or well, they don't appear to be worrying about if they're upsetting me when yeah, they're absolutely. talking about absolutely. people I love, or they don't seem concerned about it at all. Yeah. So, how concerned am I supposed to be about it, really? Mm, mm. Yeah. Especially that survival stuff, just living day to day, and because so much of our mob have so many problems. I mean, how do you focus on? This debate and all the, the the jargon and everything that goes with it, if you're burying people every mm. second week, if not yes. more, like there's yeah. no time to take this stuff in. Yeah, that's, when, a, that's what I get so frustrated survival. about is that there's these problems have existed for so long and they're just yeah. not being addressed. Going back to the Royal Commission, you know, it's like everything is there. It's all laid out on the table. And yet things are getting worse because why? You're not listening and you're not acting on all those recommendations. Yeah. It's about original. It's all about original identity. From my perspective. Yeah. I'm going to be the to you. Wow.